The Triumph Herald has a deserved reputation for being one of the easiest and simplest classic cars to own and to maintain. That doesn't necessarily mean they're easy to buy. They can hold problems that cause you expensive and difficult troubles later on. So it's important to buy the best one you can. And here is how to do exactly that. But first, our friends at Lancaster Insurance are running monthly giveaways. You can win all sorts, from experience days to tools, restaurant vouchers and tech. So click the link below at the end of the video to enter their latest competition. Obviously the Triumph Herald is famous in its time for being relatively low tech and still having a separate chassis which means that none of the bodywork you can see is structural. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't pay attention to its condition. You check the usual areas, wheel arches, valances behind the, the bumpers, check the bonnet for stone chips, check behind the headlamp bowls for rust particularly around here. This rubber seam here perishes with age and water gets behind there and starts rusting out there. The sills are semi-structural because they connect the chassis outriggers together so you want to make sure these are solid and in good condition all along and you also want to try and make sure that they are straight and that the panel gap particularly here at the bottom of the door is good. Also on the doors you want to make sure that the panel gap here is even and is definitely not narrower at the bottom than it is at the top because that shows that the car is bending on its own weight which means that the bulkhead which is structural is rotten and that can be very expensive to repair. Cars like this Herald 1250 which have a Robasto sunroof just check that this is in good condition and again the rust hasn't spread to the body panels or anything like that and the roof gutters. Check this area, the sill, where it goes into the rear wing and around the rear wheel arch. This generally means that if the rust is visible here it's almost certainly got into the chassis which we'll talk about later but more in general just check again the wheel arches, the tail lamp units. Here in the fin on the earlier cars this collects rust. Rear valance particularly around the exhaust sometimes you get exhaust gases sitting in there and rusting out there. General check in the uh, boot floor for signs of leaking boot seals, rotten floors, leaky spare wheel wells, maybe perforated fuel tanks if it really whiffs of petrol and things like that you don't want to see that. So that's the bodywork of the Triumph Hill. Very simple because as I mentioned most of the structural important stuff is in the chassis which you get a much better look at behind the famous clamshell bonnet which opens like this. The chassis rails supporting the suspension, the engine, and obviously they run back under the car to support the bodywork as well. And essentially you need to check the entire chassis as thoroughly as you can because it is the structural bits of the car. Particularly the outriggers, there are outriggers under the bulkhead which hold up the front end of the body and similar ones just behind the doors which hold up the rear end. Then there are chassis legs behind the passenger compartment holding up the rear of the body. You need to pay particular attention to the chassis legs where they curve up over the rear axle and support the rear suspension. They are prone to picking up road muck which obviously then promotes rust. Because the suspension front and rear mounts to, directly to the chassis you want to make sure that the areas around those mounting points are especially in good condition. If you do find any rust it's not the end of the world. Repair sections can be welded in so the curved section over the rear axle can need some fabrication and be expensive but everything else. Panels here and there are available for repair. Whole panel sections are available. Isolated areas of rust shouldn't write off an otherwise decent car but bear in mind that if you're doing all this work it can toss up and it's definitely not worth taking a rusty herald and trying to make it good. Save your money, get a better car, buy one that's decent in the first place. To talk about the engine I'm going to demonstrate one of the most DIY friendly bits of the herald which is that you can use the wheels as a seat. So if you're doing your maintenance it comes with rubber suspended seats. Four cylinder OHV engine, a very simple reliable conventional engine. Make your usual checks that it's got oil, it's not leaking oil, there's no signs of head gasket failure so no uh, emulsion visible in either the radiator or under the oil filler cap, that the carburetor looks like it's had a rebuild within the last century, that the oil pressure lights don't flicker when it's hot when the engine's idling. The one specific thing to mention is that these engines are known for having quite weak bottom ends, particularly the crankshaft thrust bearings wear rapidly and that demonstrates itself as excessive free play in the front pulley crank so when you put your clutch down the front pulley will move forward when the engine's running and if it's really bad the revs will drop because the entire crankshaft is being pushed forward against the bearings. If it gets to that stage the engine could well be a write-off if it's damaged the actual block but the engines are easily found second-hand, they're easy to rebuild. You'll often find heralds that have had upgrades either bigger engines, Spitfire spec engines with twin carbs and things like that. That's all good, adds a little bit of performance to your herald which in uh, modern traffic many people appreciate but bear in mind that the bigger engines 
engines are more prone to that bottom end trouble. In terms of the gearbox, again, it's the very familiar Triumph three rail, four speed unit. It should be a lovely, slick, tight shift. If it's not, that usually means that the gear linkage is worn. The gearbox itself, isn't prone to particular problems. At high mileage, they get a bit whiny and they are prone to having rattly first and reverse gears in idle. So if the gears are chattering in idle with uh, the gearbox in neutral, provided it's not definitely loud, that's usually all right, particularly if the noise goes away when you put your foot on the clutch. Bear in mind that no Herald has synchromesh on first gear, so you'll be needing to double de clutch into first on the move, but the synchromesh should be quite good on all the other gears. If it's crunching going into second or particularly third, the synchromesh is a bit tired, that may be a deal breaker for you. If not, just double de clutch, they can go on like that forever. In terms of suspension, the Herald is very modern at the front and a little bit archaic at the back. So the front has twin wishbone coil springs with dampers up inside the coil um, and the suspension uprights and in the other parts were actually used almost unchanged by Lotus. In terms of checks, it's all very standard stuff. Just check that the springs aren't cracked, they're not sagging, the dampers aren't leaking, do the bounce test, make sure the damper's quite good. The damper should be relatively strong on a Herald. One thing to check is that the trunnions need to be very regularly lubricated in order not to wear or seize. And if they seize, they can then snap and the wheel collapses. So you need to check the trunnions have been regularly lubricated and the official line from Triumph is they need to be lubricated using EP90 gear oil, not grease, because the grease doesn't flow into the threads enough and probably gets into all where it needs to be. So you want to check that they've been oiled, not greased. A feature of the Herald that people raved about in the day, right back to the present day, is its steering. It's got beautiful, accurate, unassisted, light, tight turning circle, rack and pinion. The steering should be really good. If there's slack, if there's slop, if there's knocks or clonks, it means the rack is worn, or more likely the ball joints at the front end need replacing. Not a big job, but on a car you may want to uh, question why has it been allowed to get into that state? Why haven't these jobs been done? At the rear, the Triumph Herald uses the uh, slightly infamous transverse leaf spring arrangement. Just check the leaf spring itself, if you can get a good look at it, isn't rusted and the springs aren't splayed. It's got lever arm dampers rather than telescopics. Again, just check that they are functional and they're not leaking oil. The later Spitfires had a swing spring axle, which some people put on Heralds to improve the body control. And though really on a Herald, that's not an issue. You're not gonna be driving a Herald at 10 tenths anywhere. Provided it works and it's not rusty, there's very little to uh, worry about with the rear suspension on a Herald. In terms of brakes, the Herald is very conventional. Earlier and then the lower spec cars had drums all round. Later, high spec ones had front discs. Hydraulic, single circuit brakes, no server or anything like that. Very little to uh, check beyond the usual things. Discs themselves aren't pitted or corroded. Calipers aren't seized. If they're drums, check that the, the pistons aren't leaking. Then when you're on a test drive, just listen and feel for signs of warp discs, you know, thrumming and passing through the pedal. Give the brakes a good stamp, check that they lock up evenly. Again, rather like the suspension, you do get upgrades. People have put twin circuit systems, some Spitfires and servos and things on. That can make the car feel more modern to drive, a little bit more reassuring in modern traffic, but it's not essential. And if there are upgrades, just check that they've been done well. One of the things that made the Held really attractive to people in the 1960s was it was a small car but had a big car interior and the interior really is one of its finest points. You get this lovely wooden dashboard, full carpeting, nice leather seats. To check that the wooden dashboard, the laminate and everything is all in nice condition, there's no peeling lacquer, no water damage and everything like that. If there is, it can be replaced, it can be repaired, but that's extra cost. Same with the carpets. If the carpets have got threadbare or tattered or worn, it's all available, it's not too expensive and really the same goes for the seats. The seats need re-trimming if they need to be stuffing, if the elastic bungees inside have lost all their support, it can all be done. All the parts for a Herald are available, it's one of the best things about them, but it's all the builds that tot up. Electrics, there's only about three bulbs and four wires in a Herald, so just check that it works. If you can get a look at the wiring under the dash, you want to see it's in good condition, check it's not original 1960s era wiring by, by now have gone all hard. Just check that all the lights work, you're not getting any earth faults where the indicators interfere with the brake lights and things like that. There are lots of upgrades available from alternator conversions to LED bulbs, halogen bulbs. The thing with the Herald is you can really go as far or do nothing as suits your taste. It's one of the great things about them. So that's a tour of the areas to look for when buying a Triumph Herald. In terms of what to pay, they are still desperately affordable. Basically, unless it's an absolute minter or a very early example in top condition, you won't get above 10,000 pounds. Eight to 10,000 pounds for ones in typically top condition. This particular one, which is a lovely but unexceptional example, is up for between five and six. 
three to five is your average price and anything below a thousand really should be treated as a project so you're looking at one thousand to two thousand for something that would be solid restorable but definitely needing a lot of work so in the world of triumph heralds there are no big budgets they're still an eminently affordable and accessible classic This video is proudly sponsored by Lancaster Insurance. Give them a call on 01480 400 889 for an insurance quote on your classic car. And don't forget to click the link below to enter their latest competition.